wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show. Dot com. Hey, we're coming here with a, another great podcast. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Be sure to refer the show to your friends, neighbors, relatives. Go to thecvpn.com, and you can see all nine podcasts over there. Be sure to subscribe to the show. You can also subscribe to the new book club we just launched last week. It's at patreon.com forward slash Chris Voss, where we discuss the different books, the different conversations we're having, the authors, et cetera, et cetera. It's a whole discussion shaped around the podcast and a lot of the great books we've seen launching, and you'll get uh, notifications of future releases and upcoming discussions we're going to have when we get people on the schedule. You can also see the video version of this at youtube.com for just Chris Voss. Hit that bell notification so you get all the different things that are on here. Uh, today, I'm really excited to have this guest on. We've been having kind of the serendipitous moment going from James Baldwin, and for some reason, it's all kind of fallen into Black Lives Matter and, and dealing with the racism of this country and the questions we're asking ourselves as to what we contribute, what we, what we, what we need to change. Et cetera, et cetera, the, the breakage of our culture uh, and our society. Uh, you know, coronavirus has made a lot of stuff worse. And of course, we've seen different things. Uh, we just saw recently another shooting of a unarmed black man and uh, it's creating riots in the streets. And so, you know, we're, we're dealing with these questions and what's going on with our society. His name is Roberto Lovato. Uh, the book is Unforgetting, a memoir of family migration gangs and revolution in the americas we just got a copy of it so you can take and order this book up uh roberto was born in san francisco to salvadorian immigrants who raised him in the city by the bay's historic mission district home to the highest concentration of murals of any neighborhood in the world. Lovato is an educator, journalist, and writer based on the writer's grotto. He is also the author of Unforgetting, as we mentioned, a book today from HarperCollins, a recipient of reporting grant from the Pulitzer Center. Lovato has reported on the drug war, violence, terrorism in Mexico, Venezuela, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Dominican Republic, Haiti, France, and the United States. Welcome to the show, Roberto. How are you? I'm as well as one can be in a state that's smoked, literally smoked out, where you wake up in the morning and it's got, you smell smoke and it's just, you know, difficult, especially when you have like family, like my father, who's, who has asthma. But, you know, we are, you know, we are nothing if not resilient people as Salvadorans. There you so, go. There you go. And San Francisco's too. You guys are used to earthquakes and fires, but yeah, it's tragic what's going on there. You guys have a, and the, the whole, I look at the fire map and I just go, oh my God. And it's destroyed so many beautiful monuments and stuff that we had of great trees and forests. Yeah. I just drove across the state to help a friend out in a little emergency he had. And literally the whole drive along highway five, which crosses from San Francisco to LA was a cloud of smoke. Was cloud, this, was this, this whole year, like I've had friends that they already have the mask for coronavirus, so they're using it in San Francisco for the mask to, you know, weed out the, the smoke smell and stuff. Uh, th this whole year, man, I hope, I hope this is like the bottom because <laughs> I don't want to know what 2021. <laughs> so let's get to your book. You've written this uh, excellent book. Can you give us the plug so that people can order this book up on the interwebs? Yeah, they can find it anywhere books are sold. Uh, I'm encouraging people to go to Bookshop, uh, which is on, 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 on the web, and uh, order HarperCollins, and you can see the list of different places to buy the book. Thank okay. You. And give us, uh, why did you write this book? What is it about? Give us a, why did you write it, and what's the overview? Well, I started writing it in 2015, by which point it was already clear the direction the world was going in. And I had, you know, for like, almost 30 years been sitting on this experience of war, uh, extreme violence by governments and gangs, mass grave sites, um, and a family secrets that I didn't even know about for all these years. And I feel like, I felt like, well, I've got a story of resilience to tell in a time where we need 
stories of resilience of how to, I mean, we're, people are talking about apocalyptic. Well, Salvadorans in particular have been talking about it for a very long time in terms of just being one of the most, the most violent place on earth. When I was there in 2015, when there were death squads during the war where 80,000 people were killed in a tiny country the size of Massachusetts. So these are the kinds of, and there's an adventure in it. There's a love story in it as well. And, uh, you know, I want to, to share a story of resilience and, and love and, and of humanity because quite frankly, the image of Salvadorans in the United States and in else, you know, around the world is that of the MS-13, the gang, which, you know, I've had students go and do on the internet for stories about Salvadorans. Inevitably, MS-13 comes up. So I wrote it because I want to set the record straight about how complex we are as, as people and as anyone else is. That's brilliant. I mean, that's that's the real story of human beings. I mean, we we're not just subjugated to, you know, one certain label or whatever the case may be. And uh, I think what we're finding in through this, like I say, the serendipity discussions we've been having, uh, learning a lot of different history, having a lot of different book authors that have published recently that, you know, we're talking about the Reagan years, we're talking about um, all the different factors that are going in. Uh, you know, we've even gone back to the Puritan thing of the city on the hill where people came here and white, white uh, privilege and white uh, exceptionalism or perceived white exceptionalism let's put it that way um and and kind of this extraordinary way in in how we've built different racist societies racist uh policies redlining et cetera, et cetera, and, and and you know coming back from baldwin to two or three hundred years ago and your story weaves into that with gangs and and in california and then of course el salvador and then of course what we're seeing in the white house now with with you know people using ms-13 as a straw man and everything else um uh do you want to get the ms-13 out of the way should we talk about that uh yeah. as to as to as to how big of a deal that really is or isn't let's put it that way well, can, can i talk about a point i think that you made is really sharp mm -hmm. chris about not just california but about our history right now and our history coming still remaining in the, in, in, in the interviews you're doing, in the books and stuff, you're still hearing the stuff about the past. I just wanna to speak to that if I, if I may. Uh, so I think that the reason that you, you, your very astute observation that history is still coming back to bite us and it's coming by, to bite us in the form of, of Donald Trump, of the policing, of, of a lot of different things that come from California. Okay, Donald Trump isn't from California, but he benefited from California's contribution to the White House, which is Ronald Reagan, right? And Reaganism and neoliberal economics and the policing and military models that, um, that, 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 that we're living with now, that we're, that we're trying to abolish and, or, or, and, and do away with because of the, what they, the way that they kill people and mm -hmm. jail people. And so a lot of this has to do with California and Reagan. And so I just happened to grow up in the 70s uh, yeah. and 80s. I was a low rider. I was in a little group. We called ourselves Los Origin Originales, mm -hmm. the originals, which is not a very original name. And we, weren't, <laughs> we weren't really a clique. You know, we weren't really hardened because there weren't really hardened gang Salvadoran structures. My friends were Puerto Rican and Chicano and other, and we were basically stealing cars, doing drugs, um, dating girls in stolen cars, and, uh, you know, doing, doing the crazy thing, listening to oldies and low riding and stealing, etc. cetera. So, um, so I, yeah, I grew up in that, but I actually got on my knees, speaking of, going back to, I actually had to get out of that lifestyle, and I had to, I, I became a born-again Christian. I was a right wing, and you could say it, kind of a neo-fascist right-wing evangelical because wow. that's kind of a lot of what has happened to the evangelical churches right now. So, so what I, motivated you to flip the switch on that, if you don't mind me interjecting? To get out of the church? No, to flip the switch from going into, you know, being in little gangs and, and uh, you know, stealing cars and stuff that like you mentioned there. Was, there. was there a moment that made you flip to go into religion? And uh, there's, a, there's a number of things. You know, the thing about history, whether it's world history, national history, or individual history, it, it usually doesn't come in the way that they tell us that, for example, Hitler just came down out of nowhere. Yeah. Right. Trump didn't just come down out of nowhere. There's a, there's a process and a history underneath it that make it possible. So in my case, I was an avid reader as a kid. 
to the point where I, you know, I stole books from the library here in San Francisco. I'm going to pay them back. Uh, and, <laughs> James Baldwin, and I, I think, did a little bit of the same thing. So yeah, yeah, a lot of us poor kids that loved reading did. And uh, so, but the book I most read though was the Bible, mm. and I did it partly because uh, I liked the writing, but also because I was the only one in my family that didn't do First Holy Communion and all the Catholic rituals. Mm -hmm. So eventually, when I just had to get out of this lifestyle, I had a friend who was a born again Christian who became a born again Christian, and he left our little clique. Mm -hmm. And he planted the seeds and he stirred the pot of my own, even my own biblical background. Mm -hmm. And my mom's constantly harping on me about my lifestyle, made me kind of move, a, look for a way out of the life that I was in. And I found Jesus and I found God. And I, unbeknownst to me, I found anti-abortion politics and Ronald Reagan. And I got on my knees in 1984 to play for the re-election of Ronald Wilson Reagan, something oh. I'm just confessing to you and your audience, uh, probably for the first time ever on in, in, in bless media. You. Bless you, my son. Go and <laughs> go. I don't know. I'm not Catholic. <laughs> Thank you. Absolve. Thank you for that's absolving my, me. That's the closest thing I can do to a priest is confessional. <laughs> so there you go. No, but this is interesting. This is really interesting. So you went on this journey uh, where you flipped your lifestyle and um, and you became, I mean, were you were you uh, did you start embracing? Now, when you said you uh, prayed for his reelection, was that in California or was that when he became? That was president? for his was presidency. For president and and yeah. and 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 I, I I share that story again because I think it's a story of resiliency. I, I overcame that eventually. I mm -hmm. got out of that. But yeah. I, I share it because the church was where I first learned to be a militant. Mm -hmm. As people were reading my book, I went on to do things that you could call militant of another more left orientation in a revolutionary mm. context. Mm. And uh, the church was where I first learned to be militant though, because there's fire in the blood of yeah. Jesus. Yeah. You know, onward Christian soldiers. Hmm. The fight, the world as a fight between good and evil. There's a certain understanding that I want people to understand right now as we face the election of our lives, which is we're dealing with, I think a neo-fascist, highly motivated force of zealots who have God, who believe God is on their side and that they can do no wrong and that we have our work cut out for us because on our side, we don't have anything anywhere near that kind of militancy. Definitely. So let me ask you this. When you, when you became a, um, a, a born again Christian, did you, did you start bashing immigrants or your culture or, or, you know, there's some people that I see flip. Like I see, I see people that support Trump that are, that are not white. And, and they're, they're actually like, I'll see people that I immigrated this country and I'm against immigrants. Like I'll see the interviews and I'll just be like, what the hell's going on? Right. So did you go through any of that with your born again? Uh, I didn't go through that as much because the, I think the, the Latino evangelical movement, because it is a movement, it's massive. Mm -hmm. And people should be fearing that and, and aware of that in their families. Mm -hmm. that their families are being subjected to this extreme level of mind control using the Bible. Yeah. Okay? And I, I don't use that lightly. Mm -hmm. I'm a journalist. I, but I was subjected basically to mind control with the yep. interpretation of the Bible and the politicization of it. And this is what is behind the kind of lunacy that you see backing Trump. So uh, I... You know, I, I got in because I was desperate to get out of a thing and like anybody. And I, mm -hmm. you know, I, there's nothing wrong with finding solace in the Bible sure. or in God. It's just a matter of the way that it's, it's twisted mm -hmm. for political reasons. So the evangelical Latino church is now a very important part of, of, of Trump's strategy mm -hmm. uh, in the Latino community along with all those cops that are Latino, all those border patrol agents that are Latino. You know, there's 60 million of us. And people mm -hmm. have no, and so this is like one of the secret weapons that they're gonna use in the elections coming up. And I wanted people to understand how these things came about. I was up early when the main thing was abortion. Mm -hmm. They used abortion to kind of politicize you and then, tell, then feed you Ronald Reagan and everything else that goes mm -hmm. with it. But eventually, mm -hmm. I left. Yeah, and 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 getting back to Ronald Reagan, and and we'll talk about this some more in the book, and William Barr, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, did you did you see the times where Ronald Reagan was coming up as a governor, and he would go out and do his racial stuff on uh, immigrants and stuff and Latino families? 
Did you see any of that, or did you? You know, I was, I was, that was my pre-political age. You know, mm -hmm. I was, a, you, you know, me. I was we just in a, <laughs> I was stealing cars, man. I was, <laughs> you know, low riding. I was, yeah. you know, being a kid, a working class kid. Because it was, it was interesting to me to read the history, and you mentioned about history and why it's important. We've, you know, we've been talking about this, this whole arc of the, um, the of what people perceive our heritage is and our culture is and stuff and, and white, white, uh, exceptionalism and, you know, the shining city on the Hill. Reagan was a big advocate of using that. In fact, he really politicized it. Um, and now people use religion and the Bible, especially in white Christian churches to, to, you know, do the most ugliest, heinous things that we've, you know, we've seen uh, done to Indians and immigrants and, and uh, African-American black people. Um, but, uh, you know, I always say the one thing man can learn from his history is that man never learns from his history. And, <laughs> and thereby we go. Um, you know, uh, and, and so this historical thing and this discussion of what we've had with the fallout of these crevices that have opened even wider and become so unglaringly uh, unignorable where we can't, or glaringly unignorable where we can't look away from them anymore because uh, coronavirus has broken everything in our society. So now we're having to look within and go, what the hell is going on? So you talk about this in the book of Unfor Un uh, Forgetting, a memoir of family migration gangs and the revolution in the Americas. Um, why did you structure the timeline of this book the way you did? Because you kind of hop around from different things and telling you the different stories that are in it. Yeah, yeah. That's a good question, Chris. I think it's, there's, there's three layers in my book. It jumps from 2015, the present time, to my adolescence from the, say, from my, from my, uh, you know, early adolescence to, to, to 20s and 30s, from 1970s to the 2000, and then the early 1930s in El Salvador. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it's as much about the story of me and my dad and my dad's story as it is about violence and policing and what brings it about. But I, I try to show this for different reasons. One, because I, I want to show the reader how connected and living the his that history really is. When we see uh, the Democrat, the Republican convention and all the lunacy that's there, that doesn't come out of, that doesn't come out of a vacuum, yeah. Chris. It comes out of history. Mm -hmm. Nothing is not historical. Everything mm -hmm. has a history. Yeah. So I think uh, the reason I structured that way was I want to encourage people to do what I did, which is go back and unforget things about my past and unlearn them. We have mm -hmm. to unlearn the way we've been taught the past. Mm -hmm. So I want people to pay attention to the way history is structured. And the other reason is uh, I've, you know, I was in a war in El Salvador in the late 80s and early 90s. I witnessed it. I was a participant. Mm -hmm. I saw gang violence after the war. Gang violence that surpassed the killing per day and per month during the war. Mm -hmm. And so that, that continues to this day where El Salvador is still one of the more violent countries on earth. Yeah. Now, it's also related to another one of the more violent countries on earth, the United States, who is violent, but is violent in El Salvador's case, not directly, but indirectly through its aid, training, policing, military. You know, we don't see what goes on. So I wanted readers... I structured it that way because I wanted readers to understand not just the violence, but the trauma and the way trauma, you know, breaks up your sense of time and your sense of space. Like I'm here right now talking with you and I look at you and you're wearing your hat and it kind of looks like a military hat to me. And I, got, I suddenly freeze up and I start freaking out. Right. And, I, and I, I, I'm not in the present. I start moving somewhere else. Oh. I want the readers to understand what, how deep trauma is and what it works like or bring them as close as I can to it. Yeah. Because I've had, you know, part of the cathartic work I did in the book was uh, to deal with my trauma. To re I actually retained a therapist before I wrote this book. Mm -hmm. Precisely right. because I knew I was going to open up the Pandora's box of the different traumas, not just that I lived, but that mm -hmm. I inherited from my father. My father has this heavy secret I cannot reveal or people will not go to read the book because there's a heavy secret my dad has this mm -hmm. for, in my life was nothing short of astonishing. Yeah. And so to understand the way that my dad's history and my dad's past influenced my decisions to be a crazy kid that did what mm -hmm. I did, whether it was, you know, in a little, 
you know, my little group of friends and as a teen, or whether it's going into the insurgency in El Salvador, you had to understand my dad, if you want to, so I just want, I, I structured it in these three different layers that go back and forth, because that's how, that's the way trauma, that's the way memory works. We don't, you know, at any moment, you can go back and think about your ex-girlfriend or, or a childhood memory or something bad that happened to you. Mm -hmm. You know, it, and it, it's important to learn the history of, of the people. Um, I grew up reading a lot of history books as a, as a kid, and I would read about, you know, how the America would go around the world going, we're democracy and funding democracy. And I would see the failures of what we would do, the CIA assassinations, um, the uh, Cuba, um, uh, what was it, Pinochet in Chile. Uh, the different things that we would back some of these real monsters and we would do it and they weren't the best leaders. And we'd be like, well, this is the best we have to work with, but we would back them and, and the ugly and horrific things that they would do to their, their people. And we would still stand behind them and they would become to represent us. Uh, uh, even Castro reached out to us as a child uh, and, and adored the United States. But we, you know, we were just like, hey, we're dancing with somebody else and, you know, he's bad for the people and, but we're going to stick with him. And, and we didn't see the whole thing coming. Um, well, we did, we, you know, whatever, you know, but we, oh, there's all these different examples. If you look at our history of America, where we, we try to put our thumb on the scale and we end up e either influencing the slaughter of just millions of people uh, cumulatively through all, everything we've done. Uh, even Obama's, um, you know, bombing of, of, of uh, droning and stuff, the, the fallout from that was just sickening and extraordinary. Uh, we talked before the show, and I, I became aware of this recently. We were having this conversation with one of my guests, the El, Maz the El Mazote Massacre. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is pretty interesting, and it, it, it encouraged me to want to know more about what was going on in El Salvador. And this was during the Reagan years where, where literally we trained the Salvadorian army under Reagan, and they just went in and started slaughtering just citizens and the people. One of the things I do in my book is I show up close and personal in interviews and people I got to know over the 30 years that I was describing mostly in the book. And uh, I got to know death squad operatives. Mm -hmm. And part uh, of this, you go through a track back to El Salvador, and you go mm -hmm. through, I, you go through a, a, a line of graves, or a, there, there's so many graves, I guess, in El Salvador, and so you track through it, and and you get to, you go back to your history, and 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 start understanding it better yourself. Is that correct? Yeah, those mass graves are. Are symbols. They're symbols of impunity of, of people that got away with murder, literally, because most of the mass graves in El Salvador and the individual graves, whether it's the gangs or, or whether it's um, government or whether it's death squads or the military in El Salvador, uh, most of those graves that are littering the country, literally, mm -hmm. thousands of graves, yeah. uh, are undug, unstoried, uninvestigated, and therefore... Uh, they're the perpetrators of all that mass murder that in you know, death squad operatives, military people, gang members, they're, they're living, they're enjoying impunity. Mm -hmm. So, so they're a symbol of impunity. They're also a symbol of trauma and memory mass grave because I interview those families and those families who, uh, if you lost a member of your family, they're one of those mass graves and you don't know where they are. Mm -hmm. You're basically almost becoming yourself a hungry ghost yeah. because you, you're unresolved about your loved one who's missing mm -hmm. and you want to know at least that they're how they died and they died in, and you and you're just there's this word in spanish called luto prolongado prolonged mourning it's one of the mm -hmm. great sufferings that there is is not to know what happened to your loved ones and and, and to and to live with that and to carry that cross so i went to these different mass grave sites and there's mass graves that go from el salvador all the way to texas and arizona right in wow. texas I found mass graves that, uh, you know, justice of the peace who don't know any better would see bodies of migrants who were dying in the deserts of Texas, put their remains of children and mothers in plastic bags and milk cartons and put them in, 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 in mass grave sites in places like Brooks County, Texas. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I, 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 and so the people that, that have perpetrated a lot of this, this murder, I've interviewed them. And I've wow. gotten to know them. And 
you know, I, I have to report that I actually found humanity in them. Yeah. They're I mean, an expression of the human race. They're not the a good part of the human race, but they're human. Mm -hmm. And I think when we paint people as monsters solely, it really doesn't help the process of healing and understanding and policy based on healing and understanding instead of policies based on policing, criminalizing people, which as we see in the case of the young man that was shot in Wisconsin, you know, that's just somebody who's dehumanized, shot in the back eight times in front of his kids. Yeah. That's from military training that the police in Wisconsin, in Los Angeles and other police have gotten over the years. And, and, and check this out in my book. Some of the trainers, I found out that some of the trainers from El Salvador that trained the death squads to kill 80,000 people, wow. they came back to L.A., Wisconsin, and police departments throughout the country to train the police in what we call, what I call counterinsurgency policing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's astounding, really, when you think about it, when that, 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 uh, if you look at the uniforms of our police, they've gotten more militarized. They yes. have more equipment. This, is, this was thought out. And I have parts about that in, in my book, The Way El Salvador Influenced Policing in the United States because of the trainers. Yeah. Uh, you know, the militarization of the police in our, in our state, you know, we, we first really started seeing the results of that with uh, 2014. I had the name and it just went by me. Uh, it was in, um, but we saw that we saw the huge outburst. That's where really where Black Lives Matter came out of. Um, it was the, I want to use the name Brown, but in 2014, it was during Obama and we saw the militarization of the police. I remember seeing when, uh, I think it was, uh, it was either the early Obama years or late Bush years where they're shutting down the Iraq war, or at least, you know, shutting down the scale of it. And they had cut this deal. Uh, where they were going to distribute all the, you know, extra militarization gear and give it to all the, <laughs> to give it to all the police departments. And me and a lot of friends went, that's wrong. That's going to go in a bad way, man. We don't need to be giving those boys military toys. I mean, recently we learned that the, that the uh, uh, LA school district police department had rocket launchers. You're like, or <laughs> you're just like, why do you guys need rocket launchers? Like it's what's going on to your school, man. Um, but yeah, a lot of this goes into the same patterns and things that we're trying to resolve right now with racism, with trying to understand one another, with trying to the history of everyone and what leads them. You know, unfortunately, our politics try and create this two dimensional straw man sort of thing. Uh, Trump and Stephen Miller really pushed the MS 13. As we talked in pre show, there's only maybe 10,000 MS 13 members here in the United States, they're not taking over cities. I mean, we, we'd be seeing that on the national news if somebody was, anyone was taking over a city, really. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, you know, Donald Trump and, and Bill Barr, mm -hmm. a figure, a very important figure in my book, uh, Attorney General Will, William Barr uh, and Donald Trump had a press conference last month in July, and it was basically how they were going to destroy MS-13, and they had all these mug shots and about a dozen lawyers in the Oval Office and they were painting this threat that they're now calling terrorists. Mm -hmm. And you know, MS-13 has a history of being called the most violent gang in the world. I've challenged journalists, my fellow journalists, to show me a single statistical, uh, any statistical evidence that shows that they're somehow the most violent, mm -hmm. nothing. So they're most violent because they have tattooed faces. And early on when MS-13 started in LA, when I was living there, Mm -hmm. They were using machetes to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. Why were these immigrant kids using machetes? Because they were poor immigrant kids who didn't have the, any connection to the drug trade at the time or the money to buy the Uzis mm -hmm. or AK-47s or uh, M-16 or other semi-automatic weapons that the Crips, the Bloods, the Mexican Mafia and other gangs in L.A. Mm -hmm. bought. So these kids... Because they got the machetes, LAPD started looking at them as being somehow more violent, mm -hmm. as if, as if chop, as if hitting somebody with a machete is more savage than shooting them in the face with a with an Uzi. I hate to yeah. be so graphic, but no, I'm trying to make my point. And so uh, this image of MS-13 as this extraordinary threat is is continued 
from, say, the, the LA riots when Attorney General William Barr came to LA and he did the most massive redeployment of FBI resources in US history at that time. He, he deployed 300 FBI uh, agents away from pursuing foreign agents and, and foreign threats to pursuing MS-13 in LA and other gangs. And this was during the Reagan years. This was this was in ninety two, so that 92. was uh, the from the in the in the transition from the Bush to the to the Clinton era. Bill Clinton, mm -hmm. candidate, actually came to visit our communities in mm -hmm. South LA during the rise. Some of my people that I worked with, um, and they're in the book, I met Bill Clinton, and we were talking about the problems. But nobody seemed to really want to hear our story because you haven't seen Central Americans tell their own story. Yeah. Everybody talks about MS-13 except Central Americans in public. So, um, so Bill Barr deploys his resources to fight gangs. And you look at his language, and it's the same language he used last July, except mm -hmm. it's been escalated. And so when they did that, that press conference last, last month, mm -hmm. I went around and I thought, okay, let's, this is a big terror threat. Let's call the police departments where MS-13 operates in the Virginia, uh, Long Island, here in San Francisco, LA, Houston, and a few other places. I called all of these places and I talked to police officials. Some of them didn't want to talk with me because there's, they're cops that are pretty kind of pro-Trump, quite frankly, and they're yeah. trying to cover for him. But the ones that did, like here in San Francisco, uh, you'd think with a terror image that they've killed a lot of people. And guess how many people were killed here in San Francisco in 2019 by MS-13? I wouldn't know. Two. Two. This year, <laughs> well, but this year it's zero. Yeah. In Long Island, where Trump has, you know, basically based his, most of his MS-13 crusade mm -hmm. uh, with the help of local law enforcement and federal law enforcement officials, sadly, um, under Bill Barr, uh, have created this, you know, image of MS-13 threat that has even made the State of the Union. It was talked about in the Republican convention last night. Mm-hmm. Um, and so how many people were killed in Long Island where they centered this? Well, there's a, you can see it in Newsday, uh, an article in Newsday. There's something like 5.5 .5 people per year killed in that wow. part of Long Island per year. So yeah. basically you have 10,000 members of MS-13 killing piecemeal numbers, tiny amounts of people. And you have basically a handful or less than a handful of white supremacists with semi-automatic weapons in a matter of minutes, killing more people than all 10,000 MS-13 in one year. Yep. Just well, think about it. And, and when you look at the, the way that the image is projected, it's, it's obscene. The, the, the imbalance, the, the lie, the, the myth-making. Yep. The, the history of uh, politics goes back you know, thousands of years. And what every politician has always done is created the straw man and the immigrant, no matter who it was. I mean, even Jesus was a wandering, you know, his parents were wandering immigrants. They, you know, had to go find a place to give birth. Um, and, and it's always been that way. And it, it, we never learn from this. Like people just never learn and go, Oh, there's a politician, you know, making blaming immigrants for everything and all our problems and whatever. Oh uh, yeah, we've seen that movie. Yeah, we're not going to fall for that, but we do, and and unfortunately, we keep regurgitating this hellhole of racism and everything else that still, you know, needs to be resolved. I asked Eddie Glad that when he was on the show. I said, I said, are you and I still going to be talking about how we didn't learn from James Baldwin fifty five years from now? And he goes, I hope not, um, and I hope not too. But but. Uh, it's important for stories like yours to be told so that we can get to know the El Salvadorian people, the experience and everything else. Um, and so that we can learn more about each other, what our histories are and where we come. And <clears throat> the other thing I encourage a lot of my uh, white friends, whatever you want to call them, um, white people, my white people, uh, to, to start learning about their history. You know, we've talked about the city on the hill and, and the ugly things that we've done and, and what we've done. And, you know, a lot of it's been religious-based. Like, we need to save those Indian heathens with our God Bible and, you know, they're unwashed and, you know, filthy and, you know, all that racist sort of stuff that we did that we, we literally murdered and enslaved those people under that the guise of well we're saving them um and so you know we have to learn how this goes into it and how it plays into it and a lot of 
you know, one thing I've been learning, especially with the Reagan years and everything that we did, uh, like with NAFTA, NAFTA helped create a situation where uh, a lot of South American farmers and Mexican farmers uh, couldn't compete with the subsidized corn. So they were, they were forced to start growing poppies or doing drug farms instead of what they were doing before normal farms. This is an example of how America we contribute with policy to destroy other countries and and then we create the hell holes and and havoc that go on in them and they're a direct result of what we're doing and then when the folks come here because they you know we've we've contributed to the 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 insanity that's gone on like El Salvador we we trained all those all those military that went and killed those civilians funded them trained them <laughs> yep. politically protected them yeah. And then when they come here, then we're like, well, we don't want you. And you're like, well, you're the ones who helped to get us. Here. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's the, the insanity and stupidity of this American ideal or exceptionalism just makes me mental when you look at the creation of it. I mean, you can even look at Osama bin Laden. I mean, we created the monster who came and gave us 9-11. We built that machine um, and we funded it, you know, the same, the same sort of crap. Uh so anyway, it's, it's really interesting to talk about your book. Uh, one, one symbolism that you use throughout the book, and this is part of El Salvadoran culture, and I thought it was interesting, the background of it, because like you, like you say, the, the machete is used as a, as a, racial, um, as a racial item in, in, in the thrust of you know, perception of violence. Uh, tell us what the machete actually means to, in uh, El Salvadorian culture. Well, any Salvadorans right now that are listening know, either have or know Salvadorans who have a machete, a souvenir machete in the house. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, and, and, and so somehow that became a symbol of our savagery, which is the language that Donald Trump uses. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it comes from an like agricultural society. You know, mm -hmm. you cut the cane and you, you know, you, 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 you're, you're in the country. It was primarily an agricultural society up until uh, about a, 15 years, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we have these, the, you know, we, now, now, you know, people are mostly urban. Mm -hmm. And so this machete was, was always a part of our, I grew up with a machete on our mantle. It was like a source of like, wow, you know, our roots in the countryside. Yeah. And that's and been turned into farmers. something, to something, to something else for political reasons. That's why I, I wrote the book because I want, people to come back understanding the complexity that yeah. is simplified behind these racist manipulations and machinations and, uh, and stuff. And so like, uh, I hate to go back to him, but Bill Barr is a critical uh, uh, persona in my book. Yeah. He not only pol started policing and uh, the, the heavy policing of gangs in the United States, including MS-13 after the LA riots, he also then, his, remember, the Immigration and Naturalization Service was a part of the Justice Department under Bill, William Barr. So mm. the LAPD, federal law enforcement, including the INS, Immigration and Naturalization Service, came together to deport gangs to El Salvador, a country that had no history of U.S.-style gangs. Mm. So I interviewed these kids. I was with them when, during the riots and after the riots. And I also saw what Bill Barr was doing, and um, and you know, and, and it's just it's just the cynicism to see him thirty years later continuing this enterprise of of, of racial hatred uh, and politics and scapegoating and, and, and uh, Christian bigotry too, as well, for oh. because he plays in that you know that yeah. whole white Christian I, thing. That's why I, I that's, again, that's why I came out as a born again Christian in the book, because I'm not anymore, but yeah. we have to understand these people. We are, people are, they've taken the Bible and turned it into an instrument of neo-fascist ideology in many yeah. ways. So I learned, I guess, and this is the other really important thing for me that I want to share that, you know, I was, went to El Salvador during the war and I joined the opposition to the fascist military dictatorship that perpetrated El Mosote, for example, where a thousand people were killed in a matter of hours yeah. uh, by the U.S. trained elite Atlacat Battalion, supervised, according to uh, uh, my journalist colleague, uh, Mark Danner at Berkeley, um, supervised by U.S. troops. 
that were that not only trained but they were supervising them there the 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 commander of the operation uh Diego Monterrosa so um you know a thousand people were killed you, you know and it's taken it's taken forensics experts that I've interviewed decades to figure out who was who and now we now know that half of the almost a thousand people killed at El Mosote were children under 12. Yeah. And the women were raped, if I recall. And the correctly. women were raped. Yeah. And half of the children under 12 were under age six. Yeah. So it was that's a, not just an ugly fascism. Story. So we were supporting that. So I decided when it came time, when I was down there in the late 80s, early 90s, that I was going to join the opposition to fight the military, fascist military dictatorship. And so uh, something, I, I guess, a, a plug for the book is, hey, it's, you have all this war, all this genocide, all this gang violence, you think it's a downer of a book, but in fact, it's not. Mm -hmm. It's a story that's hopeful. It's just placed against the dark background of the history of not just El Salvador, but of the United States. Yeah. The history we have to come to grips with. And so I actually tell a very hopeful, and I would hope inspired story of how to go through the closest thing I know to Dante's circles of hell or the apocalypse or whatever the hell people want to call these things. I've been through it. I've seen it firsthand and I don't have a bullet in my head and I'm still in the fight. Yeah. And I think that's and the point of what Salvadorans are about. We are in the fight uh, and we have something to share with people in the United States. And I think that's an important thing for us to recognize uh, nationwide. I mean, hopefully when we, we overturn this president, but I think, uh, you know, different tomes that have been written about, uh, Stephen Miller, white nationalism, the thing we've seen with racism, um, will hopefully turn on a new leaf. My biggest f worry is that we go back to the bombing years where uh, the racists just withdraw and go into the closets and still have their hate. Um, but it's it's important to know. Uh, I was I, I liked how you used the machete uh, in a way throughout the book. Like you would you'd tell different stories or anecdotes, and then you go the machete cuts both ways. Um, you know, you'd use different ways of incorporating the machete. And I think that's really important for people to recognize is, is, is the farming aspect of it, the, the, what the El Salvadorians were really about. Um, what, what, what put the regime in that really started uh, El Salvador's down into, um, you know, this sort, of, this sort of civil war and everything that was going on? Was it the Reagan administration? Was it prior administrations? Uh, it, it, how, how did that come about? Yeah, a good question. It goes back deeper. The, the El Salvador was one of the longest standing military dictatorships in the Western Hemisphere, mm. in the Americas. And uh, it was started in 1932 with something called La Matanza, the great massacre, the great killing, in which something on the order of 10 to 30,000 people, we don't know, were killed in a matter of about two weeks. Wow. And what uh, scholars at Oxford told me in the process of researching the book was one of the single most violent episodes, not just in Latin American history, but in world history, as far as the number of people killed per day Jesus. in a space, in such a concentrated space. Was it in order so, to seize power? Or? Uh, yes, there was a man named, uh, a general named uh, Maximiliano Hernandez Martinez. Mm -hmm. who saw an opportunity in Indian rebellion to not just wipe out the indigenous people who were kind of in the way of the big capitalists who wanted coffee, land, land for coffee. Wow. So they needed to take indigenous land. And so why not wipe out the Indians while you're at it and establish this mestizo identity, right, of a nation. So uh, Maximiliano Hernandez Martinez established the military dictatorship and initially was not recognized by the U.S., Mm -hmm. Of course, that lasted all of some months, after which the U.S. couldn't resist and started supporting Maximiliano Hernandez Martinez, the Somosas in Nicaragua, uh, the people that, that were doing destruction in Guatemala and throughout the Americas. It was, a, you know, the United States basically uh, considered this its backyard and established military dictatorships throughout the Americas. So part of my story is the way that uh, revolutionary movements were born in opposition to the military dictatorship because we always have to, I believe, tell the story of opposition to extremism and oppression. If we don't, we are screwed. 
Yeah. And, and and this is an important factor of story to see how we contribute. I mean, a lot of th- discussions we've been having recently are, are you know, even just I think the New Washington Post and New York Times put out something today on redlining. And I understood redlining from years ago because I used to own a mortgage company for 20 years. So I understood why the the Fair Housing Act was there and why redlining was important. But I, we, we all knew that redlining was still going on secretly at banks. Um, <clears throat> and... Well, the, one of the problems is, is as America, with with all this racist sort of issues we have and how it's built systematically in our society with policy and everything else that we do, we create, we, I mean, we leave freeways. We create cities that 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 perpetuate people to live in 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 hood conditions. We we don't we don't put funding into those schools, and so even when people come here or when they're they're poor or usually they're targeted migrants or, or they're targeted uh, uh, people of race and color. Um, we, we put situations in there that, that, that keep them either where they're at or put them in situations where we can constantly point to them and go, well, those are the troublemakers over there because we put them in, in a place where they don't have anything else. There's no jobs, there's no good education and everything else. And then of course, we, we, we go and, and uh, back these crazy leaders in like South America or around the world, you know, I mean, look at what we're doing with Saudi Arabia. I mean, what they did to the uh, Washington Post uh, reporter from over there. Um, but we back these people and create these situations. And then, and then we blame the people when they come here because we've created a situation in South America that's untenable and, and people can't live. And, and, and somehow people see us as the beacon of hope, which which you'd think they wouldn't. They'd be like, these are the days that started this crap. Yeah, you, you're speaking to what I call the need for an, an enemy. Yeah, yeah. You can't I mean, have a trillion dollar military budget, a thousand military bases around the world without enemies. Yeah, I mean, you, you got yeah. You can't justify policing in the United States without MS-13 or, 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 or black gangs or... or or enemies, internal enemies, when these are not actually enemies, but they're in fact the product of gentrification, displacement, deindustrialization of like South Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. In Pico Union, where I worked for for some years in Los Angeles and saw the gangs born when they were migrating from the war, they come to these neighborhoods that are deindustrialized, no jobs, no summer programs like what I grew up with uh, here in San Francisco, no, you know, social workers, no, no resources to help. You know, there's, that's what the Reagan did, right, was destroy uh, CETA, what was known as CETA, and other programs of the war on poverty mm-hmm. and, and, and urban development. And so you have these walking, talking traumas of kids coming to the United States, unresolved trauma, with no jobs, no anything, and they're being attacked by other gangs and they have to protect themselves. Yeah, and then the police start coming down on them, and they, they, you know, they start getting more violent, and then mm-hmm. you start the media kind of coming in on them and framing them a certain way, and yeah. so you have like this, you know, with some sociologists called paradigmatic, where you mm-hmm. have a, a, a set of beliefs reinforced by a community of practitioners, mm-hmm. who are reinforcing these beliefs. That's what you see when you see the gang discourse, and it's not just Republicans but Democrats. Mm-hmm. It's Democrats. All will say, hey, we're not associated with that evil MS-13, but the Democrats won't touch criminal justice in a serious way where we get away from all the mythology and fakery and get into, okay, most kids in MS-13 are not killers. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, they're kids. Some of them are 11, 12 years old. They don't have resources to help them kind of succeed in life uh, in, in the ways that are traditionally perceived as success. So... What what are these kids to do? Same with the situation in El Salvador, because we export our economic and our policing models to El Salvador. So, yeah, this is a story of like the complexity behind these these images. And and I'd like to think it also points to a a spiritual way out, how to overcome uh, extreme. We haven't seen people. People talk about apocalyptic right now, the situation in the U.S., and it's bad. Mm-hmm. But I've been walking in areas littered with mass graves. I've been in war. I've been in the scariest gang hideouts you can find. And I can tell you we're not there yet in terms of the degree of, 
of uh, profound, uh, epic violence that we we saw in El Salvador. Yeah. And so that's the story. And I'm a, I'm from the U.S. I'm not. Yeah. I'm born here, so it's it's a U.S. story. It's a story it, of resilience. It really is, and it's how we, like I said, it's the whole intertwining of of everything that we we try and do is we we're like the police officers of the world. But but you know I I see w- w- the one of the th- factors of racism is that you look at someone and you you have a prejudice towards them be, based upon their look which normally is about the color of skin what 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 happens with racists who use MS13 in politics is you know the the tattooing and stuff um, there's a real purism in in white religion where they talk about how you shouldn't mark your skin. I recently saw some memes that someone posted about how this person put tattoos on themselves so they went to hell and this person didn't. So they're pure, you know. But a lot of it is intertwined with this pure, this pureness of whiteness, which is uh, part of a racist theme in white Christian history. But having you know the MS13. Uh, folks where they cover themselves in tattoo that just adds to their whole the racist narrative of looking at somebody and they and they seem scary because they have tattoos and they're like oh the scariness of that can, can i say something about that mm-hmm. i mean yeah. you know i've spent time with with gangs for almost 30 years mm-hmm. and i watched when some of the gang members chose to use tattoos on their face i saw many that didn't even back then mm-hmm. But the and, media decided that that was the image they were going to use. Exactly. And exactly. it's still the image, even though gang members, basically the vast majority of them left that behind seven, ten years ago mm-hmm. as a practice. To But you still look at the news reporting. Even our media, is my point, my peers, mm-hmm. I'm ashamed to say, in major media are using these fake images, I mean, these, these old images mm-hmm. of MS-13 for contemporary stories. Yep. And, and those aren't just Trump Democrats. A lot of those are Biden or Obama liberals yep. in editorial rooms who are still reproducing these racist images that are, you know, used to symbolize not just gangs, but an entire community. Yep. And on top of that, there are ancient images at this point in, in our history. Gangs wow. don't do that to the degree that they did before. Wow. And, and, and that's how they use it. And, we, we've talked about on the show, we've had different authors on that have talked about in, inclusivity, inclusiveness, uh, unconscious bias, uh, things that we don't realize. And, and I think a lot of that plays into some of the, the, the subtle racism or the unconscious bias of racism as to why people use those images on both sides of the party or different journals, like you mentioned. Um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting to me. I learned a long time ago that politicians and people use that, you know, you, you have to make the straw man or you have to make the, the person to blame. And, you know, it's the look over there where we steal from you on your back pocket is usually what the politicians are up to. Um, and they're always, and like you say, there has to be that persecution. There has to be that enemy person. Like one of the things I was really surprised to find when the legalizing, legalization of pot was going on in California was the two main proponents that didn't want pot to be legalized were prison unions and police unions. Of course. Because uh, it's about the job. Um, you know, there's an interesting thing that goes through America about our capitalism. And, you know, it's been going back a lot of years, like you say, with El Salvador and coffee uh, and, and different things. And I'm sure we were looking at resources in El Salvador. It's like, we can make some money off that. Um, and uh, so we'll train the people to, you know, get everything in line so we can make some money off of that. You know, that's usually our whole angle on things that cause the trouble. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this unfettered capitalism, you know, like what you were talking about in, in <clears throat> L.A., where where people were, you know, there was a regentrification of of cities, and you know, it's like, hey, we need to move all you poor people out, and we need to build some big buildings here so we can make some money, you know. It's it, that whole factor of capitalism and and what we do as a society that causes the problems that we have, and then we're like, well, let's just throw more police at it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, there snowballs. Absolutely, I think that's the story I'm trying to tell. It's my story is as much about the United States as it is about. El Salvador, because I'm born here, right? Yeah. So I've watched as the Reagan era came into into our lives and destroyed, started the destruction of the inner cities 
and uh, uh, of rural areas that we call neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. The neoliberalism model is not just an economic model. It's also a model of policing, mm -hmm. right? Militarized policing so that elites, I don't think they just said, hey, let's throw police out. It's, it's standard operating procedure. Mm -hmm. When they've emptied out an economy in Latin America or Africa or Asia, they've instituted a military dictatorship and a whole policing model. Mm -hmm. Well, the news today is that it's no longer in the South that this is happening. It's happening here. It's, That's what I, yeah. it's happening everywhere, which is why you're seeing Black Lives Matter and other forms of opposition to policing and imprisonment because people understand at some level the injustice of the existing system is hiding the injustice of the economic system that they're instituting and that they want to keep in power. And this is a, I, say, I have to say it, I'm obliged, it's a bipartisan thing because mm -hmm. neither party has reduced the military, but how many Democrats voted to continue taking our tax money in a time of COVID-19 and giving more to the military, billions, mm -hmm. and not to, to save our lives or yep. create jobs or, yep. or, or improve the, the education of our children. Yeah. How many Democrats? All kinds of them. So it's a it's a bipartisan model that we have to we have to destroy at this point because if we don't destroy it, it's gonna destroy us. Yeah. And I mean, and immigrants contribute, I think this I got this from Gene Guerrero's book, uh eighty six billion dollars worth of net positive to our society, taxes that people don't realize they shop at stores, they, they spend money, they, they, they're they part of the economy. Uh, for the billions of dollars that we spend uh, racially abusing immigrants and, and, and people of race um, and color, uh, we, we could buy everyone in the Rust Belt a, a mansion. So for what we spend, it's just extraordinary what we're doing. And, and we do it for money and power of different factions and groups uh you know you've seen the rise of the of the immigrant uh, uh, f f uh i'm thinking of the groups that uh uh that, that uh, have all the the private prisons where they imprison the immigrants and uh human oh, is it human health and services hhs of the u.s government and the different bodies the border patrol uh unions etc cetera, etc cetera. you know there's all these factors that go into uh, it and you look at the money that we spend, which is extraordinary to think. Well, you know, and there's plenty of room in this damn country for everyone uh, when it comes down to it. So you, you you sit and you go, why do we have this as a as a corner thing? And and speaking to what you were mentioning earlier, I think what white people are waking up to is is we're not we're not exceptional anymore when it comes to the militarization of these police. We saw that in Oregon and in other cities where. They don't care that if white people come out and, and persecute, they're still going to send the feds militarized after us anyway. Absolutely. The, the abandonment of the U.S. citizenry is no longer just a black, brown, Asian thing. Mm -hmm. the, I think the rise of Trump, and I saw it here in California where this is really clearer than anywhere before. It was a, it was a harbinger. When you started seeing Governor Pete Wilson go after immigrants with Proposition 187, which is the de facto birth of the anti-immigrant movement and the pro-immigrant movement. We already knew that California was in a crisis and that jobs were being taken out of California, industrial jobs, good paying jobs, union jobs, and were being sent south of the border or to Asia or somewhere else, but not here. And so instead of explaining that to people, the need for the enemy came in and said, oh, it's immigrants. Mm -hmm. And so uh, white workers are being abandoned and the Democratic Party still hasn't figured out, I believe, how to how to deal with that, you know, politically. I think the Republicans have capitalized on it. You saw it in the Republican convention. They, you know, you're, you're, you're you know, people, people are being abandoned by their own government. That's no yeah. lie. Yeah. But, the, but, but the Democrats can't say anything because their policies helped to abandon white workers, just like they helped to abandon other workers. Yeah. So okay, I, I agree with you too. I mean, to watch Biden kind of th thread the needle of, of uh, where he's like, well, we don't want him to fund the police. And, and I'm hoping that 
on the other side of him winning election, we're going to really do some better extraordinary cleaning up and auditing and, and it, especially getting back to some of the things Obama is doing with the, the contracts with the different police departments to get them to clean up. But we need to do a lot more for what we've seen. But, you know, we've seen in Oregon, white people have got to wake up. We've seen in, in, in Oregon, you know, the, it's the same standard of it's on the Jewish center. You know, I, I, when they came for the Jews, I didn't stand up. When they came for the fasc- the, the anti-fascists, I didn't stand up. And then they came for me. And that's what we're seeing with the militarization of the police. And that's why it's important that we have these conversations, that we learn about each other's cultures. And we read stuff like that's in your book where we can understand each other's history because it's all of us against kind of like them when it comes to the rich people in the military government. I don't mean to sound, I don't mean to give that a, an Illuminati sort of conspiracy feel, but it, 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 we need to realize that the power is with us and we need to vote better. We need to demand better from our leaders. I'm hoping that Kamala Harris, uh, Kamala Harris will, uh, did I just pull a Fox there? Uh, Kamala Harris will take in, um, hopefully be a proponent for some of these things. I don't know. We're just going to have to, we're just going to have to demand more of our leaders and not fall asleep anymore. I guess. I, I'm not going to, I live in San Francisco. I grew up, you know, I lived in San Francisco during her tenure as, uh, you know, district attorney and then California attorney general. I'll just say, I don't think it's up to her. I think it's up to us. That's yeah. why I wrote this book. Yeah. I was privy to a, a revolutionary movement, I think. And I put the word revolution in my title. I wasn't talking about Bernie's revolution. Mm-hmm. I was talking about another, but I'm not, I'm not positing armed struggle, like what, what we were doing, but uh, I do think we need to think about what does revolution mean? Because mm-hmm. when we're facing not just Donald Trump, not just the Republicans, not just the Democratic Party, not just the powerful interests behind them, mm-hmm. not just COVID-19, not just the deindustrialization of the U.S. and the destruction of our economic lives. If we deal with all that, then we got to deal with climate change or simultaneously deal with climate change. So to face that, we're not going to Democrat or progressive our way out. We need to have a different mindset that's kind of like on the left, like what the crazy Christians have. We need something (laughs) that's, you know, we need something that's millenary and it's called sociology, sociological and political science circles. We need, we need a kind of conviction for the future of our children. That's, that's radical. And I hope it's to wipe out racism and racism policies and the systematic racism. All of that to, to create economic policies that are, just yeah. to to e- eliminate racism and the murderous practices that it brings. Yeah, because when 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 we see like for instance the police uh, killing in Wisconsin recently, the reason that man gets shot in the back is because that person, and it it and you can say whatever you want about policing and everything else, but somehow that person has a devaluation of that 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 type of that type of person that they perceive them to be they show up in a situation there's a bunch of black people arguing they have a perception of that they have uh, whether it's a conscious bias or an unconscious bias i've seen plenty of police officers training yeah training is training 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 is part of that and and like you say uh, they they talk about like i had a conversation recently with a uh a, a gal who's white who's married to a hispanic and she was she was talking to me about how, well, the Hispanic people have been forgotten. You know, it's all about Black Lives Matter, so we're disposable, so I'm still going to vote for Trump. And I was like, oh, my God, seriously? Um, and <clears throat> um, but and I'm like, well, do you understand that we don't see <clears> – <throat> I mean, there, there are problems with racism. There are problems with what we, what we deal with Hispanic people and, and everyone else of color. Um, but we don't see a lot of those people getting shot on the, you know, 9 o'clock news. Um, I'm sure there's probably a lot of that going on in, 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 uh, in different areas. So I don't want to be dismissive of it, but you know, we're seeing a lot of black people get shot. We have a huge issue with racism. I think the whole broadness of it, we need to take care of. But what I'm saying is, is when that, when that police officer decides to pull that trigger, trigger, he feels that person is disposable. 
he feels he's not going to be held responsible for it. And, and he makes a decision and a call based internally on those decisions where he doesn't value that person as another human being. And to me, that's really what I saw, like in videos like that, what I saw with George Floyd and, and all the other videos. There's a, there's, a, there's a loss that they have internally inside because to kill another human being, to me, I mean, you can be trained in a lot of things. I mean, I grew up in a cult. I, you know, I, I've, I've dealt with a lot of the brainwashing that came from that and different things, but there are choices you can make. And to me, when, when we reach a point as human beings where we're dismissive of other human beings based upon race, culture, heritage, or what, what perceived heritage might be in the case of a white, uh, you know, uh, perceived exceptionalism, um, that's kind of led us down this uh, horrible, ugly pathway, um, is, is, is something we need to deal with and change. Because what, what is at the core of that guy who pulls the trigger, that white guy who pulls the trigger, is the guy who is dismissive of that, that other human being, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Absolutely, Chris. Yeah. And I, I really appreciate your perspective on this. I, I, um, I hope I said that right, the, the way I no. wanted to say it. But, but there, is, there is, you know, like a lot of people, they, they blame, okay, well, police departments do this. And there is training that, that, that dehumanizes people in police departments, just like the military. And some of that in the military, they have to take that out of you because they have to turn you into a machine to, to a killing machine. Uh, I've interviewed, yeah. I've interviewed, like I said, death squad operatives, people yeah. that have, who have gone and dragged innocent men, women, and even children from their homes, Jesus. And slaughtered them and cut them to pieces. Yeah. I've interviewed them about their training in my book. Mm -hmm. I found humanity that there was still a human being there. I hate to, break it to people but they're part of the human race they're yeah. not the best part of the human race but i found someone who had been poor uh working class isolated uh didn't have a future in this poor area and was offered a future by the policing or by the military mm -hmm. then they're once they're in then they get trained mm -hmm. and i i looked at the training i did the research on the training i found documents that were released by the u.s government showing mm -hmm how they were training them to take away. You can't, something I learned from El Salvador and something I hope people take away from my book is that, yeah, you, you can't really kill somebody unless you do what? You take away their humanity. Exactly. If we, if we manage to see each other as human beings, it's way more difficult to kill each other. Mm -hmm. And so the training of the military, and I would argue some of the police, is a is a is a training in dehumanization mm -hmm. and that um you know so i wrote this book to to that dehumanization had the effect not of just dehumanizing communists or people that were left as opposed to the government mm -hmm. that was a military fascist dictatorship or not just gang members but the entire salvadoran people mm -hmm. we're we were cast in this there was actually an ins agent in los angeles who told the la times when you're talking about this many gang members that, that allegedly live in these areas, you're not just talking about a small group, you're talking about a whole people, an yeah. entire community. And this is what happens with, with, with the black community. And we have to, you know, kind of support the black community and it's, it's, it's demand for justice. It's demands yeah. for justice. And to me, when I hear black lives matter, it encompasses the full spectrum of racism um it, it it in in the systematic racism that it's in our society it's in our patterns the 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 policy etc cetera, etc cetera. to me it encompasses everything but I, I i can understand how some people look at it and go well it doesn't include me but to me it does i don't know if it includes that to everyone else but we we have to look at that you know i i think it's important what we're discussing with police refunding we probably should be the better branding for that word where we look at these communities that you and I have talked about, and instead we go, we go, hey, how do we build better schools in those communities? Because if you do studies on those communities, we've defunded the schools. You know, there's some, there's some of the worst schools in the nation because we don't spend the money for it because we give the money to the police department. <laughs> you know, I saw this great uh, uh, political cartoon that showed uh, this guy, he shows up at the door of the of the school and he goes, Hey, we got to defund you because we're busy making wars and, and, and doing other things. So we got to take all your money. So you just try and get by with what little you can. And they go to the police and they hand them the money that they took from the schools and they go, yeah, uh, here's a bunch of things, you know, make sure those uh, people at the school, uh, you know, they, 
they stay in line and they show the kids coming out of the school and there's this militarized police department going, we're ready for you. And <laughs> that's kind of what we do. I mean, we, we, we create these situations. We, we redline these areas. We create free, we do all this systematic policy racism that's so interwoven in our society. It's just insane how much of it is. Uh, when you start to really delve into it and look at it and then and then we condemn these communities because we help create them by defunding them and so hopefully what we're going to do is go continue this if trump isn't reelected and 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 everything else where where we put money into these communities i mean you look at some of the budgets we spend on on police departments and holy shit, i mean some of them the police department is the largest budget in the city and you're like, why don't we just spend that on, you know, gang outreach, on on better schools, better jobs, maybe in different areas, ways to restore urban blight, et cetera, et cetera, especially targeting these communities. But the sad part is we have this racism, so we're like, well, it's just those people. And so we're dismissive of them. And like you say, uh, what's written in your book and the description is, is to create that humanity where we look at each other as human beings instead of from a racial context of, of what we see. Yeah, I mean... I talk about as much about the police as I do about humanity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the two seem to be sometimes at odds. Yeah. And so the, in terms of like the inhumanity of the training and the practices that we see in the in police departments throughout. And, and sadly, it's not just a white thing. Mm -hmm. Look at those cops. A lot of those cops in places like L.A. are Latino and black. Okay, and Asian. Mm -hmm. So you can't. And some of the police chiefs that they're putting up to be the front men are brown, black, and a Asian Pacific Islander. Mm -hmm. And some of the mayors, including in Los Angeles, like uh, former mayor Antonio Villaraigosa, you know, he, he was very pro-cop and building up structures that were oppressing brown people mm -hmm. in, a, in a majority brown city of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So... It's really complicated. I try to get at some of this in the yeah. book to, to kind of show like, you know, I mean, I, like I like to say, if, if we don't shift the way things are going, we're going to enter the age of what I call intersectional empire. <laughs> in other words, you know, everybody's talking about intersectionality, but you know who else is talking about intersectionality is empire and mm -hmm. domination. Mm -hmm. We're going to have brown faces, black faces, uh, non-white faces and white faces being the face of the police, of corporations, of the different structures that are dominating and even destroying our lives. Mm -hmm. So that's why I wanted to tell the story because I, I get at that. It shows yeah. like, you know, the, some of the more sinister people I've met are not just white, they're Salvadoran. Mm -hmm. Salvadorans killed when those death squads. We're not free of, of, of that. Salvadorans, you know, are, 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 are as good as anyone are as noble and as inspired as anyone. So it's like... You and I think you're right on the training because one of the things that I, I was reading about when we started talking about defunding the police is how police are trained with the, the you know these videos of where you know any guy can kill you and guy can hop in and they show they they feed them through their training all these scenarios and I, I don't mean to devalue them but they're they're kind of fed a lot of this uh, you know, scenes of a uh, guy jumping out of, you know, shooting a cop and, you know, a cop killing and murders and, 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 you know, and they, they on one hand, you kind of look at it and go, okay, yeah, when you come to a car, you, there can be any sort of situation, you need to be ready for it. But then they, they put so much fear that's dehumanizing, I think, to the civilians. And, you know, James Baldwin had a, a great quote. I, I've been trying to find it, but he says something to the effect that a black man, is a it, once he becomes a police officer is no longer a black man he's a police officer and i think that's true of a lot of different races and i think a lot of that has to do with power um once you're in the club you know we see a lot of african-american people that once they become rich they're no longer like well, i don't have a problem with white people it's everything's working fine for me um you know and and that's really what a lot of this is about is the retainment of power a lot of white people in power who are like yeah we need to fund the police to keep everyone away from my pile of money um, which is really, really what they're doing. I mean, it's about yeah. power control, keeping power and control in, in any semblance. And I studied this growing up in cults and religion. You know, there has to be a group of people that you have to have control over and hold down 
so that you can will power over them. I mean, that's just the semblance of, I suppose, a basic power structure when it comes down to it. But we need to reconcile this because, you know, like you say, and like, like we've been talking about, the militarization, the police, you know, what we saw were they didn't care if they were white moms in the thing. They tear gassed them. They shot it at them. Uh, they didn't care if they were veterans that were white. They didn't care. They, they still went after them. And I think everyone needs to wake up in this country, everyone, and go, we all need to work together. We all need to understand each other better. We all need to quit pointing fingers at each other and go, well, you're the problem. Unless you're a racist, we can point at you. <laughs> um, I don't know. I have a hard time singing Kumbaya with Stephen Miller. It's I'm not sure where I'm, you know, him and I are going to have fun at a party together. Um, I might punch him in the face or uh, his other extremities a couple times if I can, but then I'm going to go to jail for sure. But I don't know. I can't say what I'm going to do if I get close to him. I'm just, I'm not threatening the guy. Let's put it that way. <laughs> we should probably edit this out of the show. Um, I'm doing jokes, people. Um, so anyway, uh, anything more we need to know about your great book here, uh, Unforgetting, a memoir of family, migration, gangs, and the revolution in the Americas, Robert Rubio. Uh Yeah, the, the, the revolution I'm talking about is not Bernie's revolution. It's I think we have now to think about what revolution means in our time. Mm -hmm. We really have to have something that, for example, the word revolution comes from physics where, you know, the sun, the earth would go around the, the sun uh, and come back to the same place. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the earth is out of equi this equilibrium, right? So we have to find a way to bring the earth and, and the life sustaining systems back into some equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So revolution has a lot to do with climate change in a lot of ways, I think. And so, uh, and climate change has a lot to do with what happens with capitalism. Mm -hmm. And so and revolution, to, you could say also is what the cyclical nature where we keep going through these, you know, we get a few good presidents that, that, uh, you know, have policy against racism. And then we get these, you know, crazy presidents like Reagan and Trump and Nixon that, that, you know, put us back into it. You know, the whole revolution of not learning from history. <laughs> We have to have a radical. We have to have a radical consciousness to face the radical problems that we're facing as a as a human race. Most definitely. Sadly, sadly, I, I would have to add, in terms of immigration, mm -hmm. there was a president who first caged thousands, tens of thousands of Central American children. I visited those kids. I saw their little scars on their necks when they try to hang themselves. Jesus. I saw the mothers trying to slit their wrists. I've seen them suffering and trying to protest and they wrote letters to this president and to his <laughs> wife. That president was not Donald Trump. It was Barack Obama. Yeah. And so yeah. we have to have any revolutionary sensibilities, not going to fear critiquing a president because of their race or their political party. We have to have the clarity to be able to critique fairly. Right now we got to focus on getting Trump out. There's no question. Mm -hmm. I would be the, the last person to want anything else. I mean, the first person, you know, we, we have to have him out, but definitely we can't take our eyes off the prize of real justice. And if the continued policing, the continued economic policies, the continued military policies that are destroying the planet, literally, mm -hmm. physically, politically, and otherwise, if they continue, regardless of who's in power, we are going to continue on the course of worsening our condition. So I think a revolutionary mindset is in order right now. And I think that's a lot of what my book's about is asking, I don't have the answer to what revolution means now, mm -hmm. but I do, knew, I do know enough to know that we have to ask the question when I don't see a clarity with respect to dismantling the core things that are dominating us, which mm -hmm. are economic oppression and military policing. So I, I really humbly hope that people find something in my book that 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 inspires them because i put all my heart and soul into it and 30 years of trying to do the right thing i think i think they will it's a great book it's a beautiful book um and i, I don't mean to, our whole discussion here we've had a few dark com conversations but it's a beautiful book going through telling the story of your family and everything else the experience of life uh, this is a catharsis sort of journey, cathartic journey, um, in going through your history, finding out more about you, who you are. We all go through those experiences in life, so I think we have a rapport with the sort of value that goes into it. Um, just in the final mentioning, uh, you know, we just recently saw the uh, 
one of the guys who worked in the White House has been coming out. He was actually on the Daily Beast show podcast, and he talked about how Trump actually talked about memeing. You know, you're talking about the immigrants with the marks on the necks from hanging themselves. He talked about memeing them. This just came out, I think, today. He talked about maiming them or doing extraordinary things. We saw, you know, Stephen Mill, Mill, Miller's cruelty is the point where they they tore the babies away from their their parents to send a message. It's like it's like a sick mafia sort of move where it's like we're gonna send a message, we're gonna cut off his dick and put it in his mouth, and that way everyone will know the message. And you're just like, what a sadistic, just subhuman sort of thing to do but um you're right we need to actively stay awake even though even though we get biden elected if if biden gets elected let's cross our fingers um we need to, we need to as a society uh you know talk about these things and keep the conversation going we can't we can't just go well we fixed that thing so whatever you know um a lot of people when obama came in office are like well, we fixed that racism thing yeah that's all done we need to hopefully stay actively awake and uh, change our policies. I hope cities across the nation will start recognizing uh, what's going on and we'll, we'll continue, like you say, that discussion and everything else. Um, it, Roberto, it's been great to have you on. You're welcome to come back on anytime. We could talk for hours and stuff. About Thank this you. Stuff. And what I, what I love about having these conversations is I hope a lot of my white friends, my white people, um, start having this internal dialogue and I've been getting a lot of messages about that. So I really am proud and happy about that. Uh, I get messages from people that are saying, uh, thank you for having this discussion. We're starting to have this discussion internally because we're seeing you have this discussion and, and the example that you do from trying to listen through this. And, and so I hope, I hope a lot of my friends uh, and people and, and everybody is, is having this discussion with themselves, it prejudices that they have, racism they may have, unconscious bias that they have, and they're realizing how much this is contributing to the, the disassembling of our society and destruction of it on a long-term scale. And so, like you mentioned, it's time for revolution. Let's learn from the past and change the future. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an honor. Thank you very much. It's been an honor, my friend, to have you on. And I'm going to be excited to finish your book. Uh, be sure to check out the book. You can go to Amazon.com. And then what's your .com, Roberto? Uh, Roberto Lovato, L-O-V-A-T-O, dot com. Dot com. Go ahead and check it out. Uh, I think you'll like the book. And it's a wonderful adventure. It's beautifully written. It's a memoir of a family, migration, gangs, and revolution in the Americas. Unforgetting it's important to learn our history. Thanks to my audience for tuning in. Be sure to give us a like. Subscribe to us on YouTube.com if you want to watch the video version of this discussion. Uh, go to... Uh, what else is there? Patreon.com for Seth Chris Bosch. You can join the book club. And also, you can uh, tell your friends, neighbors, relatives, the CVPN.com. Learn about your history so you don't repeat it. Have an internal conversation with yourself. Learn about your unconscious biases. And let's change this world and make it better. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you guys next time.